Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Lakeside on this first Sunday of 2022. And probably the coldest Sunday we'll have in a long time. We're so glad that you came out to either to meet here with us in person or uh, hopefully uh, you're there in your home watching over the internet. We want to say welcome to each and every one of you. We hope that you'll enter into the service praying, singing, and then responding to God's message for us. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of James, the fourth chapter, the 13th and 14th verses, which please stand as I read God's word. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Susan's coming out to lead us in worship. Thank you. 
direction. I pray, Lord God, that the Holy Spirit leads him and guides him. God, that you would empower him with you. And he might make decisions that would ultimately glorify you. And God, we pray that for all of our children. God, that you might guide them and lead them and feel them. Let them make decisions that glorify you. We pray, Father God, that when you call, they obey. We also want to lift up Frederick and his children. God, we just pray your hand over them. We pray that you continue to touch them, to lead them. Whatever's going on in their family, Father, that you would be right there in the midst. That you would bring peace. That you would bring joy. And Father God, that you would bring this family closer to you and closer to each other. We lift up Robert and his family. We pray for all those that have experienced the loss of Ricardo. God, we just pray blessings over them that you would comfort them and console them as only you can. And we lift up the salvation of that word. God, we know that it's your will that people might come to be saved. We pray that Edward is in a place where he's exposed to the gospel. And God, that you would respond to the call of salvation. And God, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit. That you would lead them from that point on. And God, I pray that you would lead them to a church that preaches and teaches and practices the truth of your word. And God, there's many of us here and online that have requests of our own that are not verbalized. So God, we ask that you would search out the hearts of your people. We pray that you would hear the cries of your people, the petitions, the requests. And God, will be reminded to give you glory and honor and praise for the answer of prayer. Now we ask that you have your way here this morning. Saturate us in your Holy Spirit. Let your word go off, Lord God, accomplish you what it's sent out to do, not returning to you, Lord. Have your way. We love you. Praise you. God, we pray blessings on every family represented here for 2022. God, we pray that you would lead them and guide them. And we pray, Father, for opportunities to share with you. God, that we might live a life of obedience to tell you all people. About Jesus. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Up to your left or right, somebody might need help off and just going to make his way to come and pray for his honors and our offerings.
that people come to know scripture that much better. And if you do not today, then that is your choice. Can't blame the church. Can't blame the teacher. Because we don't look at the messenger, we look at the message. Regardless who is doing the teaching. Given that it's biblical, of course. Jesus had much to say to the churches who seemed to get away. In fact, he had so much to say that he instructed the Apostle John to write to seven churches that, or six really, that have gotten away, or seemed to have gotten away too. We will look at one this morning. The title of the message this morning is Evaluating your spiritual life and the life of the church. If you're taking notes, I hope you are. If you don't have your outline, you need one, raise your hand. One of the deacons will bring that to you. We got one up front. So evaluate, evaluating your spiritual life and, and the life of the church. We're coming from Revelation 2, 1 through 7. Let's please stand for the reading of God's Word. We're reading from the ESV. Let's try to keep with what we talked about last week. We're stopping at commas and making a complete sentence. And there's one. And if you would just follow my lead, let us all stand in honor of God's Word. <clears throat> to the angel of the church in Ephesus, right? The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Who walks among the seven golden lampstands? I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and I cannot bear with those who are evil, but I have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and find them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Surrounding area there. 
but he also speaks today to the churches of the 21st century. He also has the pastors who are committed and surrendered to his leadership he holds in his hands. He says, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, which refers to the churches, the seven churches in Asia Minor. So you, you know that Jesus was walking, even after his resurrection, in the first century among the churches, you can best believe that he's walking in the midst of every church as it existed, because the churches are actually his. They're not. It's not mine. It's not yours. It's his. His church. His body. He is the head. We are the body, yes. We all fit together. And we are called to uh, the church to gather for, uh, and to gather the assembly of gathering together, rather. Excuse my pain of words there. But we are called to worship God corporately, to come together. Now, I've said this before. Um, do we virtual church? Sometimes, yeah, there's a need for that, as we saw throughout the pandemic. But to stay doing virtual studies and virtual church, that's not church at all. Because church is a gathering of God's people. You hear all these different excuses about, we are the church. Yes, we. Remember the we. So it's not just you being at home. It's we being together. The assembly. The gathering of God's people. To worship him. To praise him. To be in fellowship with him and each other. This is the, the church. And it was the same back in the first century. Now verse 2, listen to this. Again, this is Jesus speaking. He says, I know your works, speaking to the church of Ephesus. Keep in mind, the city of Ephesus was as pagan as can be. This was the place they, they call it one of the seven wonders of the world, the Temple of Artemis. The Temple of Artemis, better known to the Romans as the goddess Diana, or the goddess of fertility. You've probably seen statues and pictures. There's a, a woman, a female, who's standing with all these different multiple breasts on her, because they call her the goddess of fertility. And this was their main event in Ephesus. Every year they had an event where people would come from all over to worship Artemis or Diana. And among her were hundreds of other idols, statues, gods, little g. We know that they're not deity at all. Scripture tells us wherever a uh, worship that I have a worships really to who? To the demons. Mm. To Satan. Because there is no. He's behind every idol. He's behind every false god. Yeah. And this is what the people in the first century were dealing with. So I want you to keep that in mind as Jesus is speaking. He says, I know your works. <clears throat> now I have to explain this. Because it, it, make, it, it gives you a, a, a vivid HD in color picture of what Jesus is saying. There's a, a standard general word for no, it's skenoso. When you take the language to read, you want to learn Greek, that's one of the first words you're going to know. Genoso. Genoso means I know. Now, I know very limited things. Just like you know, very limited things. But this word that was chosen to be used here in the Greek, Jesus speaking, and he's speaking of himself, it's ode. Ode. 
and it is to know in its fullness, to have the totality of knowledge of everything that is going on in the church. So it makes a whole lot of sense that when Jesus says, I know your work, it's not the regular, standard, general, you know so. But instead, it's the whole day. I know with full extent your works. Now, obviously, he's speaking to the church corporately, but he's also speaking individually because the people make up the church. He says, your toil and your patient endurance toil was the fact that they gave their all. Every fiber of their being, they gave to the church or to the ministry for the sake of Christ. They gave their all. They gave their best. <clears throat> and your patient endurance, meaning that even in the severest, even in the most trying times, that they have given their fullness over to the service of God. Nothing hindered that, at least not yet. <clears throat> and Jesus recognizes this. So this is a compliment to the church of Ephesus. And Jesus is saying, I know that you guys brought your best. I know that you guys work every fiber of your being. And I know that even in the severest of suffering, you continue. He knows it all. He knows what people go through. He knows what churches go through. And he says, and then he adds to it, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil. You see, they had a high standard, the church. They had a high standard of the holiness of God. Hello. Man, that is what we need to bring back. A high standard of God's holiness. That we're sensitive to sin. There's something else. They had a high view of Scripture. That is a church that, that we want to emulate. That's a church that we want to follow in their shadow. A church that has a high standard for holiness. High standard or a high view of what does says the Lord, Scripture. And then it says, if I have tested those who call themselves apostles <laughs> and are not. You know, they just didn't accept what people were telling them. They put them through the test. There was in the early uh, church uh, writings, first century, second century, and later there were some writings that said that if a so-called apostle came to visit, you make sure that he has a place to stay and food to eat. And he should only stay one day. If he happens to stay another day, fire him, you feed him, and you send him on his way. If he stays three days, and if he asks for money on his way out, he's a false apostle. So they had a criteria that they held on to, at least, you know, in church history. And they tested them. And they come to find out that they were not apostles at all. Where was the testing? What was the criteria for the testing? Scripture. A high view of Scripture. Remember, Scripture has the final authority. Not what he says, she says, or they say, or not even what the pastor says. It's what scripture says. That is a final authority. It says they found out and found them to be false. Verse 3. I obey, I know in its fullest sense that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. And you have not grown weary. You know, some people would disagree with this, and that's fine if they want to be incorrect. 
But I, I, was, I made this statement, I won't get into all the details because I can't, but I made this statement that being a, a minister, being a pastor, could be a very lonely place. It, it can. I mean, here you are serving God, here you are serving people. I'm not just saying this for me, I'm talking in general. And people just, you know, lead them to the side. Which, which every pastor, every minister has to come to grips in the door. They come with the terror. If this is what I'm called to do, and he asked this week, not just me, if this is what I'm called to do, to be in a place of loneliness, if this is the price that I have to pay, speaking of pastors again, not just me, then this is what I will pay. So just so you know that, that FYI. And Jesus is saying, I know, and we see through the scriptures that these first century believers are in that same way. Their focus, they were tunnel, tunnel focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. I know, he says, and I'll skip over that because we just read, and you have not grown weary. You have not given up. How many times? That people wanted to just give up. How many times pastors just want to, you know, throw in the towel? I'd be lying to you if I did, if I were to say pastors don't never want to quit. Oh no, we get those thoughts just like you do. Maybe more because we deal with more people. But he's saying that you guys have continued to endure patiently, bearing up for my name, saying that not growing weary, not giving up, not quitting, not throwing in the towel. They didn't give in. They didn't give in to what was going on around the church. But they continued to stay focused on the Lord. Galatians 6 9 is not on the PowerPoint. It says, Galatians 6 9, if you're taking notes, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season you will reap if you do not give up. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season you will reap if you do not give up. Every believer throughout all the centuries are encouraged not to give up. Jesus says in the Gospels that men ought to always pray and not give up. Even when the going is tough. That men ought to always pray and women and, and young people and not give up and not give in. You know, you and I as believers, as well as the first century believers, we are called to continue. I think I said that some years ago. I don't use this as much as I need to. But if I can sum up the Christian walk in one word, it would be continue. Continue. What I went through, continue. Why well, didn't continue? Well, I continue. That's all that this is about, is to continue to move forward in our walk with God. Not to grow weary. Not to quit. Revelation 1, 9 through 11 says, I, John, here's his testimony, your brother and partner in the tribulation, and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. This is where he's writing in this letter. He was exiled there after they tried to kill him in a morally hot substance to which he lived. 
And then he was exiled. They didn't want to hear the word. Put him over there. We don't hear him anymore. Hello. He still speaks 2,000 years later. It's still speaking. You can never shut up the gospel. You can never put the gospel in a corner. And John had the privilege of writing. You know, you think he was holy? Death. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, Sunday, the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, and to, you begin to name all these churches. Today we're focusing on Ephesus. Revelation 1, 19 and 20 says this. This is still Jesus. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are though, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars, here is just pretty up for our that you saw in my right hand on the seven and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels, the idols, the messengers, or the ministers of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So this is where the information comes from. Scripture, interpreting Scripture. They didn't come from somebody else's thinking, well, this has to be this. This is called the analogy of Scripture, whereas Scripture interprets Scripture. It's consistent from A to Z. Yeah. Point two. Jesus challenges the church to repent. He challenges the church to repent. We go to verses 4 and 7. Now Jesus was complimenting them, telling them all these things that they were doing well, but <coughs> there's a but there. I have this against you. Some translations say, I have this one thing against you. I mean, man, you're doing good in all of these other areas. Man, praise the Lord. You you're have a high standard of holiness. You have a sensitivity to sin. You have a high view of scripture. And you're not only just talking about it, but you're living it. But I have one thing against you. That you have left your first love. ESV, you have abandoned your first love. And I thought, I, I thought, what could distract, what could be so important, what could be so pleasurable that would distract you and me from getting closer to Jesus or from knowing the scripture that much better? What could be better than getting closer to God? What could be more better than knowing God's word, the living word, the logos, Jesus? What could be better than that? What could distract us from that? We have left our first love. Plain and simple. So if we sit here, if you're watching online, and we're not closer to the Lord, we don't know scripture that much better. Chances are, in some area of our life, we have left our first love. Just like the call to the church of Ephesus. There was something amiss. There was something not happening. You see, you can do all these good things, right? And you're doing it for the name of Jesus the same. Or for the sake of his name, and still miss it. And here, here is the counsel of the exhortation of Jesus. He says, it's a command, by the way. He's telling them, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. And here's the remedy, here's the solution. Repent. Yes. Remember, obey. I know your works. 
the fullness, every single thing that there is to know about the church and the life of its people, Jesus already knows. And he's challenging people. He's challenging the church of Ephesus. Remember. Command. Do you remember how, how on fire you were? Some of us can relate to this. Some can't. I would hope everybody can. But do you remember when you first got saved? Man. <laughs> Right? The world that was on your shoulders was lifted off. You were no longer sitting in darkness, but you were transformed into the kingdom of light. You no longer felt dirty and shame, but now you feel clean because you were cleansed with the blood of Jesus Christ. And you want to tell the world what has happened to you. And really what Jesus is saying is, what happened to that? Where is that at? That's never supposed to go away. That's never to diminish. Remember, he gets bigger, we get smaller. That's the idea. But in some people's lives, you can just look at the lives of people. And you can see that. We can look at the lives of ourselves. This is why we are evaluating ourselves. Where am I? Where am I being with the Lord? And where do I want to be? He says, repent. Turn around. Get it right. And do the works that you did at first. The evidence of repenting is doing the works that you did at first. What did you do at first? If you remember, you remember when you first got saved, man, before the doors were open, you were sitting there waiting to get in. Man, I want to hear God's word. You know, you were the first one here and the last one to leave. <laughs> On your knees every day. Praising God, thank you for calling me this, this sinner. Thank you for having mercy on me after all the things that I did. Man, and it just kept you close to God. And somewhere along the ways, oh yeah, I know I'm saved. You're still saved. You're not going to lose that. But you lose that real, tangible relationship, this love relationship that God wants to have with his people. And we abandon our first love. We walk away. Before I go on, best illustration is a married call. When, a, when a, a, a couple of newlyweds, man, they're just crazy in love with each other. Oh, man, I would kiss the ground as they walk on. She's the air that I breathe. Okay. We might say that for the first year, but we never argue. We were made for each other. Second year. How do you have today, Will? I'll make you some soup. Here you go. Hope you feel better. Third beer. You not feeling well? Why don't you make yourself some soup? <laughs> Things begin to change. Yeah, do you still love each other? Yes. Do you still want to be with each other? Yes. But at some point, this Crazy love that we have, one for the other. Sit down. How do you get that back in a marriage? Do the things that you did before. Win her. Win him. Bring some flowers. Give some compliments. Go on some dates. You see, you do what you did before as you were trying to win their love. But well, now I have to win the love, so all that stops. That doesn't have to. So you want to keep that, keep that 
far in marriage burning. And that is what Jesus is saying. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. He says, if not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Now, individually, you will not lose the Holy Spirit that you really belong to God. You are sealed unto the day of redemption. Nothing can change that, not even you. And yet, it's a mystery in some cases how that works out. But what he's saying here is the church. If there's no repentance, if they don't get back to their first love, if they don't stay focused on what is important or more important, not to say that all these other things that they were doing are not important, but they're less important outside of their relationship with God. And he says, if that doesn't take place, I'll shut down the church. I will close its doors. There'll be no church. If you guys want to just do things routinely, I'll close the doors. Man, that's, that's some tough language here. But he's using this as a way of bringing us to what? Repentance. That there'll be some change there. I got to go on. He says, unless you repent. Verse 6. Yet this said, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. There's not a whole lot of information about uh, Nicolaitans or the works of the Nicolaitans, but some scholars believe that this could be the person, and it's just speculation. That's all. But just to fill this in here, it could be a uh, Nicanor, who was one of the first deacons that were chosen back in Acts chapter 6. They kind of went a different way. They committed apostasy, trying to get people to follow him. That's what scholars believe. Again, speculation. And Jesus is saying, this is, these are the people, or this is the group that I too hate. Strong word, right? But we are to hate the things that God hates. And we are to love the things that he loved. We want to love righteousness. You want to hate sin. At least when you get there, if you're not there already. We need to just hate sin. Hate death. You know? Verse 7 says, He who has an ear, here's some more counsel or uh, exhortation. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Remember, you've heard this before, akul, or shema, shema in Hebrew, akul in the Greek. That means that you hear, but you hear with the intention of what? Acting. Which is the worst thing ever that people have been doing for year after year after year. We come to church, we sit, we hear good sermons, good music, we have fellowship, and we go out, never apply God's word to our lives. Mm -hmm. And we remain a baby until God calls us home. Mm -hmm. Still a baby in Christ. That is not God's expectations. God's expectations is for us to grow as believers. To grow in our relationship with him. He says to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is eternal life. And we see that in Revelation 22, there'll be a time where that tree will be back in the lives of God's people. That is a promise from Jesus. And he says, which is the paradise of God, heaven. Okay. What is repentance? What is repentance? Here is a Hebrew word that you probably do not know. Nakun. That says nakun in Hebrew. And the transliteration is nakun. Correct? Nakun. Which
which means to be moved or to have regret. This word here always has the, has the, the connection to God and God only. So this does not mean repent like you and I do. We repent of our sin. God has no sin. Therefore, he does not have to repent. But what this word means, nakum, is to be moved with compassion. That means that when a person repents, the judgment or the severe punishment that God was going to dish out to someone, God changes his mind out of compassion because the person repented. So keep that in mind. Your next word is uh, Hebrew, and it's called, it's pronounced shove. Shove. Your transliteration, shove, as you can see up there on the screen. And it simply means to turn back or to return. And this signifies people. Shove. To turn back. To return to God. So it's not just, you know, God, I'm sorry. Here. But never turning back. Never turning. Never turning around. Never turning away from sin and turning to God. It's not just something we say, but it's, it, it's followed by something we do. That is true repentance. Now, we have to go to the Greek. Metanoia. This is metanoia. This means I repent. Metanoia is repent. That's the word that I wanted. But that's metanoia. What you see there is a W that is the equivalent to I. So I repent. That's how you would read that. Repent. It's a compound word. It's metanoia. Meta means after. Noia means change or an afterthought. To think differently. To reconsider. To change your mind. You heard me say this a thousand times here at Calvary. And this is just an easy way to remember. And some of you already got it because I've heard it uh, quoted by you. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a changed heart. That leads to what? Change, change of direction. Easy. Change of mind, change of heart, change of direction. So pastor, how do I apply all this to my life? I'm so glad you asked. Whatever you did at first to fall in love with Jesus, keep doing it. It becomes indignant in your life. It's not something you've done in the past and you're not doing today, but it's something that you do every single day. It becomes indignant in your life. Whatever that looks like, man, I'm going to be in God's Word every day. I'm going to be in Scripture. I'm going to be on my face praying every day. Now, I, not, this is not the bride, just as a way of teaching. I try to make it my business to be on my knees every single day. There are some times I might be running late now, I run out, but I do it here if I don't do it at home. But my uh, spiritual resolution for 2022 is never to leave home without being on my knees every single day. Don't lose that. Whatever it is that you need to do to have that back. Some of you may have heard this before. I thought you have heard it. When I first started going, working on my bachelor's degree, I had people tell me, what well, can we pray for you, Bob? We people, pastors in Chicago, you know, how can we be praying for you? And my number one prayer request, then and still is this day, Pray that I do not neglect my walk with God. That I don't get too busy. That I get too busy 
and I have to correct my walk with God. That is my prayer. And, and that is my prayer request even today. God, don't let me get too busy that I neglect my walk with you. Because here is where it matters. Because based on what's going on here is what's going to dictate what's going on out there. Conclusion. A thousand years of remorse over a wrong act would not please God as much as a change of conduct and a reformed life. A.W. Tozer. Let me read that one more time. A thousand years of remorse over a wrong act would not please God as much as a change of conduct and a reformed life. As Susan makes her way up here, how is God speaking to you today? How does God want you to respond to his word? You contemplate that within your heart and in your mind, and you act appropriately. Susan.
crown him more happy. Renew the love. Renew our relationship. Let us start now. Let us start today. So, Father, at the end of the year, I can say, I am closer to the Lord Jesus this year than I was last year. I have been exposed and know more scripture today than I have ever known it before. God, I want to pick that. Not so everybody can see, not so everybody can hear, but God, so that I can have that life with you. That real, intimate, love relationship with you through your Holy Spirit. God, fill us with you. Maybe there's somebody listening who's not a believer. You've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. And you know that you're a sinner. You still live with guilt and shame and maybe you're tired of being sick and tired. You're tired of failing. You cannot walk this walk without God. And what you would do is, God, just say, God, I repent. I believe that I'm a sinner, lost, separated from you. I know that I need to be saved from my sins. I'm asking Jesus to be my Savior. And God, empower me with your Holy Spirit so that I might live a life like he's my Lord. Forgive me. Forgive me for all my sins. Empower me. Fill me with you. God, I thank you that nobody can take that away. Not even me. Give me a will to be exposed to you on a daily basis. God, thank you for Calvary Lakeside. We love you. We praise you. We look forward to seeing what you're going to do in the life of this church and our individual lives. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you. Happy New Year's once again. Let's stand to our feet as Susie comes up and blesses us out. Tell somebody about your church, but more importantly, tell somebody about Jesus Christ.